To moderate and kick off this panel, we have Dr. Jeremy Surrey. Dr. Surrey holds the background Distinguished Chair for Leadership in Global Affairs at UT Austin. He is professor in the Department of History the, and, and the OBJ School of Public Affairs. He's a prolific author, editor, podcaster, you name it, he's done it all. He's amazing. Jeremy Surrey. Thank you, Lara. Um, do we have our two other panelists online at the moment? The yes. Yes, okay. Yes. That's one. Who is that? Uh, there we yeah, go. Yeah. Yes, hello. Dennis hello, you Lee can both. see us. Mm -hmm. Lee and Dennis, you can see us? Yes. yes. Great. So I, I'm really excited. I've been looking forward to this panel all week uh, as I've been watching most of the conference from various uh, offices of mine on campus as I've been meeting with students and hearing excuses about why end of term papers are late and things of that sort. Uh, I'm really uh, excited for this panel on post-truth public diplomacy. Uh, among other things, I write about the history of diplomacy and also contemporary diplomacy. And there's no doubt that uh, this is where a lot of the main themes of this conference come together with day-to-day -day policy making. How do we manage diplomacy in a world where uh, it's very difficult uh, to even begin with a, a basic fact pattern when we're talking about something such as the war in Ukraine, uh, US-China relations, whatever the topic, uh, whatever the topic is. So we have a, a distinguished and wonderful panel to close out uh, the conference here. Uh, Dennis Wu from Boston University is going to summarize his paper. We're gonna keep that relatively short because first of all, the paper's available and it's a very readable paper. I've read it myself. Uh, and uh, so Dennis is gonna summarize the paper for us and then we're gonna have a discussion uh, kicked off by the three distinguished discussants we have here. Nicholas Cull, who everybody knows is Mr. History of Public Diplomacy uh, from the University of Southern California. I've known Nick now for, I think, more than 10 years. And he always is uh, doing exciting work. Uh, Lee McIntyre from Boston University I haven't had the pleasure of meeting Lee in person, but I know of his name, and I'm excited to, to see what he comes up with today and has to say. And then my good friend and colleague, Art Markman, who uh, I think is going to bring a really unique perspective as a leading psychologist, as a leading scholar of psychology, uh, as well as someone with a lot of experience in the world of at least academic diplomacy uh, to our understanding of these, of these issues. So, so Dennis, if you would kick us off, take maybe about five minutes to give us some of the highlights of your paper, if that's okay, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. So I'd like to share my screen with you guys. So I try to uh, condense my presentation to this uh, short version uh, because uh, I feel this is probably a better approach to summarize rather than uh, go through the full length. So uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, introduce my paper. So let me uh, get right to it. So the first component of this um, concept, post-truth public diplomacy, is about post-truth, right? So um, uh, they are other related terms such as disinformation, misinformation, fake news, junk news, and so on and so forth. However, I just echo Lee McIntyre. Uh, this is, uh, post-truth is more comprehensive and inclusive than any of them. According to um, the library's definition, uh, post-truth is, quote, relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and the personal belief, end of quote. So post-truth uh, differs from propaganda in that uh, the top-down model may not necessarily be required. Also, uh, voluntary unintended users who transmit post-truth content are less likely to exist in the propaganda context. Also, another good thing about using post-truth in this circumstance is that it may contain native advertising, which is a controversial practice that blurs and integrates editorial content and sponsor products. Post-truth simply functions better in explaining the filter bubble phenomena in today's media landscape, where users pick effectively and the cognitively consonant content to consume. This consumption pattern has been exacerbated 
by new technologies such as deep fake and uh, algorithms. Post truth also can be the culprit that uh, propels populism, extremism, and the partnership, a uh, partisanship. Uh, excuse me. So the second component of this concept is public diplomacy. Thanks to a lot of scholars uh, in the audience. Uh, you know, uh, I don't want to get into detail about this, so I assume everybody knows about that. But the mediative version of the practice is more uh, relevant to post-truth public diplomacy. For those who do not have direct access to foreign locales, media sources are usually the only avenue to learn about foreign nations and the global events. So naturally, media's impact on this topical area uh, is greater than other topics. This is precisely why information about or images of a nation in the media matter. These can be derived from either facts or personal impression, subjective narratives, and even emotional uh, connections that are prevalent on social media today. Over the mediated national attributes can be parts of a nation's brain they can result in economical, cultural, and the political consequences. What's more, these messages about nations are often assisted by professionals in the media and other uh, areas. When these messages are about elections or candidates that can influence uh, voters' perception about electoral processes and peoples from other systems about democracy, which is a value system that vies to win hearts and minds uh, of the world. So um, after this is all elaborated, I think that we can uh, just use the uh, definition uh, to elaborate uh, the term. So post-truth public diplomacy uh, is a new form of public diplomacy that employs uh, post use content generated through social networks and uh, overseen by host countries to influence the cognitive and effective condition of publics in target countries. So um, I'd like to use this chart to summarize the roots of uh, PDPD practice. Um, So there are four rules that uh, uh, po post-truth flow can take place. We use the US as an example of target nation. First, a country or its proxies can launch post-truth campaign in the US. The roots of campaign can also be uh, direct or indirect because of the internet's porous nature. The third route is US sources relaying uh, post truth to other parts of the world. The last route is the domestic sources, such as uh, domestic influencers, that could be capitalized and incentivized to advance country X interests. These last two routes may also carry advantageous public diplomacy content or PTPD antidotes that are related to the US for either domestic or foreign publics. So uh, another chart to show you, uh, this chart summarizes the roots of existing PTPD practice in blue, and uh, my proposed solutions, they are in red. So I place a great deal of duty on uh, the target governments, uh, which may be shared uh, with uh, nonprofit entities or groups of concerned citizens, and maybe volunteers can uh, share some of the duties. For example, uh, fact check services can be pursued by nonprofits, uh, and the civic groups or crowd sources can lobby hard to remove, verify this information from uh, social media platforms. Particular emphasis should be placed on target publics for whom. Three areas of work can be elevated. Uh, Post-truth inoculation can prove to be most cost-effective means. So um, to conclude, uh, PDPD exists in an interdisciplinary crux and uh, its influence on international relations 
and global affairs cannot be underestimated. Under challenging circumstances, such as wars, immediate remedies may be needed to steer the development in the right direction. PDBD's delivery channels, so far we talk about social media for now, new spaces such as entertainment, gaming, metaverse, and so forth that can be far more engaging and therefore more powerful. Their long-term impact should be evaluated. Lastly, well-orchestrated efforts across different governmental agencies to prepare and respond to all of these uh, PDPD campaigns should be pursued. So that's my cliffhanger presentation for you guys. Thank you. And uh, any feedback would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, thank you for your succinct and compelling presentation. Um, oh, my microphone. Not my microphone. Thank you, Dennis, for your succinct and compelling presentation and for really giving us a lot to chew on. Uh, Nick, let me turn it over to you. Um, well, thank you very much. And I should say I've read the whole paper and... Uh, um, uh, I find it uh, you know, very interesting and uh, a helpful uh, addition to the conversation around contemporary public diplomacy. But there are a few uh, a few places where I want to uh, uh, push back. Um, and uh, first thing is to say um, that I think you correctly make an argument that something has changed. However, this is not the only tool out there. You're not the first person to articulate vocabulary around the change. And the dominant uh, term that is used in the field of public diplomacy studies right now is sharp power. So it would help if you could differentiate between uh, post-truth public diplomacy and sharp power, because you seem to be describing exactly the same thing. And I, I, I can see that there are differences, but it would be useful if you could draw those out, because, you know, uh, linguistically, it doesn't help to have two words for exactly the same thing. Um, the, I think that uh, as a historian, I come to this and um, have to ask, what is new? And public diplomacy, if you take it in the broad meaning of a government's attempt to conduct foreign policy through engagement with a foreign public, uh, there have been uh, use of untruthful mechanisms in the past, not only by governments of which we disapprove, such as the government of Russia, both uh, Soviet and pre-Soviet, uh, but uh, uh, you know, by the United States, and by Great Britain, and I'm, I am truly continually upset by some of the stupid things that British intelligence did in uh, public diplomacy space during World War II to try and draw the United States into World War II, which very nearly blew up in their face. So um, I, I, I don't think that just the untruthfulness is sufficient to create a uh, a new term here, but what I do think, and where I do think you're onto something, is with scale and technological mechanisms, which are clearly creating a different kind of uh, uh, super environment um, uh, ar around uh, the um, availability of social media technology. But again, to go back to my historian hat, every time there's been a new media technology, there's been uh, a, a period of great chaos and, and instability. And one of the really frightening things is that we forget uh, about the chaos uh, because we remember the event that the chaos caused. So nobody calls World War I that war that happened because of the popular press destabilizing foreign policy conversations. And nobody calls World War II that war that happened because some crazy people in multiple countries had access to radio and newsreel and helped them to steer publics in an unprecedentedly uh, unproductive uh, direction. Um, I also want to push back on your use of the term public diplomacy, because whilst you are describing a practice in the global engagement of foreign publics for foreign policy purposes, that umbrella of public diplomacy also includes 
very benign practices, such as listening to a foreign public, such as exchanges with a, a foreign public, or indeed cultural diplomacy, wholly benign cultural diplomacy, and cultural conversations and uh, uh, shared activities. So is the East-West Divan Orchestra uh, somehow, uh, we can't imagine a post-truth version of that or a, a post-truth Fulbright exchange. There are some things here that, are, that exist apart from the world that you're, the world that you're describing, but are all, and I think a part of the antidote. And the final thing uh, I would say as a historian is we shouldn't forget past responses to hostile media. And one of the lessons from the later Cold War is that sometimes the best thing to do with communication you don't like is not to communicate about it, but when the time is right, to negotiate about it. And there was a, uh, an information disarmament process with the Soviet Union, which included um, the United States saying we really don't like Russian propaganda and the Soviets saying we really didn't like Rocky IV and, the, and a, a serious conversation about mutual stereotyping and moving beyond that by uh, opening of mutual journalism bureaus, increasing access. The most interesting part of this is the moment when uh, we've heard a lot about the AIDS libel but nobody's talked about how that went away. And what happened was uh, a representative of the US government confronted the Soviet uh, uh, representatives in, um, uh, during a, a conference in Washington and said, unless you stop saying this, we will stop uh, cooperating in any scientific research with the Soviet Union. And that was so uh, such a shock and um, uh, that it, it, it caused a debate in Moscow. The Americans escalated further and began publicizing Soviet use of disinformation and using it to shame the Soviet Union. And at that point, Gorbachev pulled the plug. And there's a sort of a two-year period when there is no uh, KGB use of the, of the AIDS story and the Soviet Union backs off on its routine use of, of disinformation. I'm not saying that we should try um, to have a disarmament process with the Soviet, with the Russians now in the midst of a crisis, or that we should have a negotiation with the Chinese, but we should remember that there is a potential for negotiation and that in the right circumstances in the past, this has helped. And I think that, it, that somewhere on our toolbox, information disarmament needs to be remembered. And, and to, to some extent, that, that happens even in the relationship with Russia. Certainly, every time Vladimir Putin says something about nuclear weapons, this kind of discussion actually occurs, right? So uh, we shouldn't leave that out. I think that's really well said, uh, Nick. Uh, Lee, let me turn to you next, if I might. Sure. Thank you. Um, you are all experts in public diplomacy, and I am not. So I'm going to butcher a, a quotation. You, you all know immediately where it comes from and what I've gotten wrong. I remember the phrase, war is diplomacy by other means. Uh, was it Clausewitz? Yeah, that's Clausewitz. War um, is politics by other means. Politics by other means. Um, well, so is post-truth. Uh, post-truth is a tactic of war. And uh, the, the definition that the Oxford dictionaries gave it originally, I think, is a little too soft to capture what I the way that I define post-truth in my 2018 book, Post-Truth, uh, because I like I want to draw the link to authoritarianism. I want to draw the link to uh, power. So I define post-truth as the political subordination of reality. So you imagine, why would you want to subordinate reality? You want to subordinate reality because you've got an interest at stake that, you know, the Facts don't help, and so you want to pretend that something is true when it's not. Now, there are a couple of other, but there are other people in the world who maybe don't agree with you, and so how do you approach them? Well, this is where post-truth comes into play. You've really got, you've got propaganda. You could use propaganda to try to persuade somebody that your point of view is correct, um, propaganda can be either true or false. You, you can believe it or not. I mean, propaganda is the kind of the umbrella term 
uh, here, because sometimes people share true things that they believe, but in a propagandistic way. The more insidious, the most insidious type of propaganda is disinformation, because disinformation is an intentional falsehood that is shared to deceive, not to convince, but to deceive. So it, it's like you're, you're stealing the cognitive consent. You're not giving somebody a good reason to agree with you. You're tricking them. You're fooling them. And I think this is where it gets really dirty, because if you do that, then the point isn't really to persuade the other person. It's to dominate them. The, and so I see post-truth as a, t a tool in the authoritarian's toolkit to try to dominate someone's reality. You can, it, you, you know, say you share a falsehood and you want the other person to believe that falsehood is true. Great. That's part of it. But the other part of it is to make them cynical, make them feel uh, dominated, you know, make them feel like maybe there's no way even to know the truth, because if there's no way to know the truth, then there's no accountability. Then there, then there's no such thing as blame or consequences, really. So I think that, you know, in any discussion about public diplomacy or about politics in general, we have to accept the idea that post-truth is about power. It's not about facts. It's about power. And I'll, I'll say again, I think that the, the best definition, the, 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 the one that I use, is that post-truth is the political subordination of reality. It's this grab to say, no, no, this is true, because I am so powerful that I can say it whether it's true or not. Now, that last part is the quiet part that they don't say out loud. But, you know, when you have an authoritarian, when you have a dictator, and they say that something is true. For the people in the, you know, under the suppression, it might as well be true. What are you going to do? That's that's the danger. That's the real worry. And so, um, how that fits precisely into what how you've defined public policy, I'm going to have to leave to you. I've said my two cents. That's super helpful, and I think it's a it's a perfect transition to you, Art, as as a as a leading scientist and scholar of so many of these issues from a from a psychology point of view. Help us understand these issues. Yeah, no, I, I find this. I mean, I I love all these discussions, and I've been trying to follow as much of it online, you know, the last few days as well. But um, you know, I I think about actually in in the context of these discussions, the concept of public license to operate. Right. I mean, if you think about about lots of things that people want to do in the public sphere, um, they're allowed to do it sometimes because laws allow it, but mostly because the public allows it to happen. And and so in many ways, you know, what the degree to which uh, a, a campaign to influence people to believe things that aren't true. Or, or, or at least to be confused about what's true is is as mu as much as anything when you know to either destabilize public uh, license to operate in someone else's country or to try to enhance it in your own, and so because you know at the end of the day even if you're an authoritarian regime authoritarian regimes do get overthrown at at some point when when essentially the public loses faith in in them and so you know in large part what you're trying to do is to get people within your country <clears throat> to accept that that the the actions of the government are are acceptable not not necessarily just not necessarily right but acceptable enough that I'm not going to do anything to get in the way of them that I have other goals that are more important than whatever it is that the government is doing and with, with respect to other countries it's similar it's just trying to destabilize things enough that that there isn't enough will of in in the public to galvanize uh, opinion in ways that would support intervention in some other place so, so it's it's actually enough uh, to just try to confuse the issue, right? It's it's it 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 really, you know, it it you know, a lot of times when we focus on wow, it's it, we don't want people to believe the wrong thing, but it's just as bad to create a situation in which people just throw up their hands and say, well, this is just too much work to figure out. I'm going to disengage and pay attention to something else. 
Uh, it is, you know, it is to the advantage of people who are trying to do bad things to be able to lurk in the shadows. And, and this, you know, by, by creating confusion around a set of issues, part of what you do is to get people to look elsewhere towards things that are easier for them to understand. And, and so I, that's, that's part of what I find fascinating about this. And it, you know, and from a, you know, and, and part of what that means from a strategic standpoint for governments is that they have to try to, to, to find ways to create some sort of coherent narrative that enables the people of their country to, to find some sort of unifying way of, of, of telling a story that allows that story to be somewhat resistant to the confusion that's being created. And, and so, you know, that, and that's, and, and, and people, you know, I will say people love coherence, you know, and, and it's, the, you know, it's, it's the reason why, um, you know, when you, when you're trying to argue with someone, you know, you, you, I always tell people when you're, when you're having an argument with someone else, you never actually convince them of your point of view. What you try to do is give them enough information that ultimately they can convince themselves of your point of view. And that often happens, sadly, uh, for people who are trying to convince people of things because it's never satisfying. It happens out of your sight. You, prevent, you, pre, you, you present them with a bunch of little landmines and time bombs that go off later, and then they come back singing a slightly different tune because you've created a slightly different set of facts that end up becoming coherent for them. And so finding ways to create that coherence, preferably rooted in truth, um, is, is probably the most effective strategy. I think that's super helpful, Art, the way you, you brought that together, because so much of what diplomats have been traditionally taught to do is to establish fact patterns, right? So much of the traditional training of a diplomat, right, if we go back to the sort of English and German tradition of the 19th century, is you're an expert in a particular area of the world, and you develop a fact pattern for understanding how people interact in that area. And that's sort of, uh, to Dennis and others, sort of the question I wanted to put on the table for the next part of our discussion here, and hopefully we'll get an audience involved as well. You know, to, is the opposite of post-truth public diplomacy, is it truth diplomacy? I mean, I think of the ways in which uh, Bill Burns and the U.S. government tried to weaponize truth against Vladimir Putin, and I think quite successfully, right? So they released, right, in a way that I've never seen before, released actually documents they wouldn't have released otherwise, substantiating war preparations on Russia's part. Not everyone believed that. In fact, I think the post-truth narrative was the more dominant narrative before February of 2021. But then after the war began, the accumulation of facts and the connection of those facts to a set of behaviors on the ground actually, I think, undermined much of the propaganda, much of the post-truth diplomacy that Vladimir Putin had been pursuing in a very sophisticated way. Um, and, and, and so what, what fascinates me about that is it is an understanding of narrative and coherence, um, but it's also, in, in a certain way, right, it's a return to the most traditional kind of diplomacy, which is I'm going to release the documents, I'm going to show you uh, in the way Nick referred to World War I, right, that, that the British government was trying to show that the Germans were mucking around in Latin America, right? I mean, so, so I, wonder, I, I wonder how we think about truth and post-truth uh, in that sense. And I, I think everyone here on the panel has a, has a thought on that. Uh, Dennis, should we go to you first, and then maybe Lee, and then Nick and, and Art? Yes, um, so I think that uh, the fight against post-truth um, public diplomacy is not necessarily the fact itself, uh, because uh, when I think about post-truth, it can be really about post-truth. Um, uh, the, the, the consequences or the reactions to the information, right? So a lot of times uh, the factor of emotion, the factor of uh, psychological mechanism are at work in processing information. When we think about information, uh, there are a lot of attributes attached to uh, a fact or information. Sometimes um, people are willing to 
accept and process. Other times, even though you are presented with uh, the best fact available, you may not have the willingness or mechanism to process. And so it's not necessarily about presenting facts or uh, truth to fight against post-truth. I think that it's about um, a constant work that's needed. And uh, it's sort of like a, um, uh, a well-coordinated uh, efforts across different branches of a government to um, do things that can really have sort of a mass effect so that uh, the majority uh, or, or significant percentage of the uh, target uh, publics can be on the side. Therefore, uh, more people will join, uh, we jump on the boat. Uh, I think, I think it's, it's, it's more complicated than just uh, um, involving uh, a few diplomats or uh, some workers that are specializing in information or campaigns. Uh, it, it really uh, you know, takes a village to get things done. So it's more complicated and uh, it needs a larger scale effort. That that makes sense, uh, Lee. Especially from the post truth perspective, is yeah, yeah. Um, telling the truth can be very effective. I mean, uh, it's you think of all the cognitive biases that uh, you know work in, about repetition and you know whether it's a trustworthy source, et cetera, that work in favor of of lies. Some of those biases work in favor of telling the truth too. The the move that that you describe of the Biden administration when they uh, and there's a the technical word that they use in the trade is pre bunking, right, or inoculating, you know, by sharing the truth at the strategic time just before the Russians were about to engage in this false flag operation, they defanged it, and that was brilliant. And the reason it's brilliant, I think, it, it, it especially in this context, the thing that we have to remember is, so the traditional route is you persuade somebody and then it changes their beliefs and then it changes their actions. But to, to go back to something that Art said here a minute ago, sometimes the point is to disorient them, right? Because if you disorient, you, maybe you don't worry about what they believe, maybe you don't worry about persuading them, you just you know, this is a Russian technique called the fire hose of falsehood. You just tell one lie after another and the person becomes so disoriented, they think, well, maybe I can't know the truth. That is a direct way to affect their action, right? Um, that because what you're really after is to change the action. Maybe you don't care about the belief. So post-truth, you know, they they just want you to feel disoriented and afraid and cynical and upset and, you know, feeling that you can't know the truth. Well, pre-bunking, Telling the truth is effective in two ways. It's effective in persuading you of what's actually true, which is wonderful. Changes your beliefs, changes your, your actions. But here's the thing. It's also effective against disorientation, right? Because, you know, in an environment in which somebody is just confused because they've heard just a fountain of self-contradictory lies and they don't know what to think. The truth can cut through that. And so, you know, all of a sudden, when uh, uh, Biden's spokesperson, I think it was Jen Psaki, came forward and shared this intelligence, you know, that, yes, the Russians had a false flag operation planned. You know, this was what they were going to say. This was where it was filmed. These are the actors they're going to use, et cetera, et cetera. That was just very refreshing. I mean, all of a sudden, people could say, yes, that makes sense. So it cut right to the heart of the matter. I'm I'm very much in favor of fighting back because we're in a we're in an information war. I think that the most effective way to fight back against lies is with truth. I I really like that answer because I mean it does seem to me there is what we're what we're saying is it's not simple, but there is a place for truth in post truth yes. public diplomacy. Nick. Well, I I, I, um, I agree, uh, and um, I, I think that um, that it's it's uh, important. This the moment of pre-bunking was a really important moment, and that came out of uh, reflecting on media during COVID. It had been developed as a um, effective public health communication strategy, and I think that 
in, in fact, the Ukraine war uh, or Russia's war in Ukraine has created a number of examples that suggest we're actually getting control of the information environment. And we are no longer living in 2014 when Putin's dark magic worked anywhere he tried it. Now, uh, it, it's working um, ge in, in geographically specific areas. And I think that the, that we can see the value in media literacy, in making people aware of uh, uh, what, where their information comes from and that they have to practice good uh, sense when they're sharing material online. We're not all the way there yet, but we are so not where we were in 2014. We're coming to terms with the, the world in which we live in, and that is a historical phenomenon too. You can see the same thing as people get to know how to live in the world of the popular press, how people live, learn to live in the world of uh, radio, and, you know, for example, Orson Welles' War of the Worlds is part of that process. And we're going through those, uh, those moments all, 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 the, uh, all, all the time. Uh, the other thing that I want to say is that um, part of the problem is that uh, post-truth media is not only used by foreigners against Americans. Americans are very good at subverting themselves without reference to the rest of the world. And, and part of America's media tragedy right now is the way in which uh, all the things that you know, Dennis and, and uh, and Ben have been describing are, are present in American media to Americans. Uh, and sometimes I think that we need public diplomacy solutions, but we need exchanges that get people from red states to blue states and, uh, and, and, and back again. We need an internal Fulbright program. We need internal cultural diplomacy and internal information disarmament talks for an internal reduction on stereotyping, demonization, and uh, a, a general uh, disruption of the, this precious thing that we have in this country of, a, of a, a, a free public space in which to discuss who we are and where we're going. Right, it needs it, it needs nurturing and and cultivation. Right, absolutely. Art, uh, how does the the pre bunking notion resonate with cognitive psychology? Well, I, I I mean I think I think you know there there are two two things to say here. Right, one is that that. Um, we every every bit of information we get is interpreted in part through a set of beliefs that we already have and so by providing people with alternative explanations for what's going on in the world you you can at times help to inoculate against at least a certain amount of misinformation because again it's about coherence if i have a coherent story and you throw a lot of things at me that don't really add up um i i, I may have a cognitive edifice that will withstand that that kind of, um, of of attack but but you know the the problem the fundamental problem with truth is that it has its truth delivered by a trusted source and so you know you also need to create the trappings of trust associated with that I mean if you think about was Hoover as wrong as as, as, as people thought he was versus you know Roosevelt being as right or was Roosevelt just particularly good at making use of a medium at the time that made him appear a trusted source right Reagan again very very much a trusted source in the way that he delivered information. And I think that, that, that there are times that we, that we undervalue the trappings in which the, the, the message is being provided. But particularly uh, when you think about uh, group, uh, an, an information environment that is destabilizing because it's so incoherent, incoherence is, is psychologically a, an uncomfortable emotion. So, so, so what do people want when they're uncomfortable and anxious? They want comfort and, and, a, and a haven. And so, you know, it is, it is in those difficult times that you see those communicators who are good at being the comforting source of, of stable information that then provide uh, that conduit for truth. Could I come back on that, Jeremy? Because I think that Art uh, said something very profound that goes to one of the things that I, I, th I think is most commonly misunderstood about propaganda. 
Uh, people look at propaganda and they imagine that the skilled propagandist is taking an idea from their head, sending it down whatever communication apparatus they're using into the mind of the audience. And I, I, I think that that misunderstands what's happening. Really, what, what's happening is that the communicator is recognizing an idea that's in the head of the audience and using their speech to affirm it and to connect that affirmation to an action they could take in the real world. Vote for me, fight for me, donate to me, whatever, whatever it might be. And that, that's actually much more, um, in, much more dangerous and... I think a lot of the paradigms that, for example, the State Department uses when it thinks about, oh, we can put out a piece of true information, you can, but it's not going to be the same thing as, uh, as communicating in a way that aff affirms somebody's prejudice. But we can find ways of affirming things that we all agree on and exploring those affirmations to play exactly into this reassurance that Art's speaking about, as during World War II, when the government learned not to counter uh, a story that a particular minority group didn't have to serve in the US Army, but making sure that every time Hollywood depicted the US Army, there was one of every minority group in uniform fighting for this thing that was worth fighting for called the United States of America. And they, that was a much better solution, to have media that affirmed the things that were already in our head, our best selves that were already in our head. Right. That's really in its, in, in its worst, uh, the, the darkest interpretation of that is it's a method of reflexive control. Sure. Right? You, you let the person think that it's their idea. That's best way to teach you know, also. That's yeah. right. <laughs> right. But I mean, that that's the most persuasive thing. Yeah. We, um, as an administrator, I'll say it cuts both ways. Yes, I was going to say that too. This is really what the faculty wants. Um, so we are at time, but I want to ask one more question. It's the Susan Sontag question I want to ask, right? How does a world that's image rich play into this, right? Because it seems to me that images uh, provoke us in ways perhaps that words don't always, right? And um, as I think about uh, the way we create incoherence or we shake coherence, uh, images, uh, this is an old point Susan Sontag made about photography, right? That they decenter us from some, some forms of truth reasoning, such as it might be. And so I'm just curious, quickly, I know it's a big question, but I didn't want us to leave this panel without discussing it. Dennis, to you first, to what extent, or how do you think about an image-rich environment more so than ever before in this post-truth context? Well, I think that uh, images of any nations or global events are in the middle of post-truths. Uh, they play a great role in shaping perceptions. Uh, as most psychologists would say that images are more powerful than text. Uh, you know, images retain in humans' brains longer than textual uh, uh, um, uh, uh, content because uh, our cognitive structure is shaped in such a way that uh, uh, we can retain image uh, longer. Um, so that has a lot to do with, again, uh, emotions, affects, sentiments. Uh, they are uh, harder to move uh, in human beings. And so when we are providing antidotes or facts or truths to challenge some of the uh, people who hold uh, different kind of perspectives, we need to take that uh, existing image structure into consideration so that uh, uh, it's easier, uh, therefore, to um, you know, uh, uh, plant new um, uh, ideas or new facts into their uh, uh, memory system. So that's my take on that. Art, do you do you agree? I mean, the poets might differ on the. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I, I think, I think, the, I mean, I, I think what's important to bear in mind is that is that images are always specific 
by definition and specifics, specific things, you know, th those are very convincing, right? One, one death is a tragedy, or, you know, a million deaths is, is a statistic. And, 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 you know, when you see a particular image, that is a case study of a particular thing. And consequently, and particularly if it's, a, if it's an image that involves people with, who we naturally will empathize with, it, it does create, I think, much richer uh, uh, emotional reactions than you're likely to get from most other sources, poetry aside. Great. Great. Lee, and then we'll close with Nick because we are at time. Yeah. Uh, what a great question to, to think about images on the, 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 the relationship to post truth. The, the low hanging fruit here is to talk about deep fakes where, which, you know, we, we all know, but as I've been trying to sit here and think of something new to say about deep fakes, I can't except that what occurred to me is that there are some deep fakes that are compelling, even though you know they're fake. And, and sometimes that can uh, get those emotions rustling in you and, you know, be the political subordination of reality. And I'm thinking here of myself. I'm thinking here of a fake video down back in during the Mueller investigation that was of Trump being arrested by FBI agents. And, you know, I study fake news for a living. I knew it was fake, but I could not stop watching that thing because I got a dopamine hit every time I watched it. So, you know, here I am studying fake news, post-truth, you know, all these things. And I knew it was fake, but it was still giving me the desired uh, uh, hit that I wanted. That's powerful. Images are extreme, can be extremely powerful. Yeah, that's a great example. Nick? So what I would say here is that one of the features of uh, social media platforms now is that they're no longer just text. They are text plus image. And if you uh, look at Marshall McLuhan's tetrad of uh, new media, um, he always asks, what is recovered in this new media? And what's been recovered here is the, the, the power, even the primacy of uh, image. And as a historian of propaganda, every campaign I have ever studied has had a highly significant, even winning blow, delivered by an image, particularly uh, an image of a child, and that uh, which goes, I think, exactly to what Art's talking about. And um, you, you think about how transformative in debates particular images of children have been. Um, the, the napalm girl image, the boy, uh, uh, the dead child being carried in Soweto, which after which it became really uh, nearly impossible for the South African government to defend its behavior. Or Alan Kurdui, the little little boy dead on the Turkish beach, the impact that that had on the uh, debate around um, uh, the, the debate around migration in in uh, Western Europe. Um, so absolutely, we need to think about images, and part of how we build media literacy has to be. Um, uh, image literacy. So Susan Sontag is the right thing uh, uh, to talk about because you know all images are not created equal. They resonate in different ways. Uh, I think that what Ben's saying about uh, uh, deep fakes, uh, this this is very very important. And a discussion, this kind of discussion, is part of the uh, part of the solution. And that's why I'm so happy to be uh, part of it. So thank you very much, Jeremy. That's great. And and I'm glad we came to. I think consensus that universities need to make sure they teach art history because where else are you going to learn to read an image but in an art history class, right? Uh, I want to thank our panelists and I want to thank the organizers of the conference. This was a really wonderful conversation to have right now. Thank you, everyone. Nick, Lee, Dennis, and Art, thank you very much. And, and now I think Art is going to give a closing statement to us for the conference. Yeah, that's right. So um, we've, we've come to the end of, of what has been uh, fascinating. I'm, I'm only sorry that I couldn't be at every single one of the presentations. But, um, but uh, again, just, just for those of you who may be just tuning in now. So Art Markman, I am the Vice Provost for Academic Affairs at the University as well as, um, as, as, well as a professor of, of psychology and human dimensions of organizations. And, and I just want to say, first of all, thank you to all the organizers. Michelle, you need to take a bow to everyone. It's really been an amazing <laughs> labor here. Um, 
And 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 to all of you who who participated in all of the the various ways, both through your talks and through your questions and through your just attendance and attention, um, thank you for helping to make this a reality. We can't you, you we can't put on a conference unless there are both people to speak and people to listen. Um, but I I want to leave you with with. Um, with one thing, which is a, a conference like this, unlike many of the conferences that I attend as an academic, where I learn a lot about a topic and, uh, and, and may be inspired primarily to think about my research differently, these are topics that while they may change the nature of some of the scholarship that gets done, are very real, very present, and, and, and very important for us to use to take action. And so as you, uh, as you prepare to leave this conference mentally, uh, some of you are here physically as well, but those of you playing at home, you're gonna shut your computer in a moment. I want you to do me one favor before you do that. And that is, I want you to create what psychologists would call an, an implementation intention. And the idea behind an implementation intention is I want you to think about a very specific thing that you can do differently on a particular day in the next week that will be inspired by what you heard here that will allow you to take a step towards allowing your sphere of influence to be different next week than it was this week. And just by taking the action of thinking through that specific thing, you will make it much more likely that you actually will take that action and allow this conference not just to be a pleasant memory or a pleasant image, but also to be something that continues to live on in the work that you do. So thank you to all of you. Thank you to the organizers. And, uh, and, and, and I hope that your engagement here with the University of Texas has enriched you as much as I've been enriched by my engagement with all of you over the last few days. So thank you very much.